We are in the hinterland of northern Alberta, but we are also on the edge of Holy Russia. This river marks the border. In this tiny cluster of houses and on separate farms in the area live some 300 members of an archaic sect of the Russian Orthodox Church. This remote settlement is fixed in another time, rooted in another place. The past is always present here. These are the old believers, self-appointed guardians of a thousand years of Russian Christianity. They arrived here in 1973, after circling the globe in search of a hiding place where they could follow their old ways in peace. Six miles up the river is the farm of the Rutov family. Few outsiders have ever set foot in their house. The old believers avoid contact with the outside world, which they consider morally and physically polluted. Eating lunch together, Anastasia and Yefim Rutov are protected by their exclusive faith. Everything here, food, drink, plates and spoons, is sanctified by ritual, reserved for the faithful. Outsiders like ourselves are pagan, unclean. We aren't allowed to eat at an old believer table, nor may we touch their plates and cutlery. It's all part of a long struggle to preserve the purity of the old Russian faith. have been married for 35 years. During a life of endless hard work, they've raised 11 children, most of whom are married now with families of their own. Still living at home are the two youngest sons, Ivan and Pashka. Grappa is the last unmarried daughter. The oldest member of the Rutov clan is Baba, Marina Semenovna. She is Anastasia's mother. Generation after generation, family ties have overcome persecution and exile. Today a feast is being prepared. Aunts and uncles, children and grandchildren are gathering for a celebration. A month ago, the Rutov's son, Denis, married his sweetheart Olga in her old believer settlement in Oregon. Now, according to religious custom, they've come to set up house near the bridegroom's family. Religion dictates every aspect of life here. The details of clothing and hairstyles, food, drink, and the Russian language that holds them together. They're all ordained by God. These are a people who have turned life into a perpetual act of worship. The newlyweds are toasted with shots of braga, a homemade fruit wine.
Before drinking, an old believer makes the sign of the cross to drive the evil spirits out of the drink. It's then tossed back in one motion before the demons have a chance to slip back in. Braga is part of the Russian heritage. It's the only form of alcohol permitted. Hard liquor, beer, even coffee and tea are believed to be potent sources of contamination introduced from the West, which these Russians say is in the grasp of the devil. The Braga flows freely on this day of celebration. In this family-centered faith, marriage is a major cause for rejoicing. For these two 17-year-olds, it's the beginning of adulthood, their entry into a long partnership with the promise of a new family to carry on the faith. There are other Old Believer settlements like this one scattered around the world, in the Americas, Australia, Eastern Europe, and in the Soviet Union. All of them seek isolation, building barriers around themselves to keep the pagan world at bay. Others have called them the Old Believers, but their name for themselves is Christianini, the Christians. They believe they're the only Christians left on the face of the earth. It's a life driven by an extraordinary sense of mission. On them and their solitary faithfulness rests the future of the world. The Lord said in the Gospels that he would not destroy the world if somewhere there remained at least two or three righteous people. The end of the world has not come. This means that somewhere on the face of this earth there must still be a few good Christians. This river that winds through their lives is a source of spiritual purity. Christ's baptism in the River Jordan imbued all river water with the Holy Spirit. All Old Believer homes are built beside a river. They cleanse themselves, their animals, their food, and every household item in this holy water. The old believers inhabit the world of ancient Russian piety, a borderland located somewhere between heaven and earth, between time and eternity, where everything is suffused with spiritual meaning. Poised between the visible and the invisible, they sense the luminous presence of God. The world is like a vast icon, revealing God's loving presence. In every aspect of their lives, the old believers imitate creation, repeating over and over his divine forms.
The entire physical world is a transparent surface, a window through which one can glimpse the harmony and perfection of heaven. Domestic life has the exactness of a religious service. Its forms designed to manifest God in every detail. Each morning, Anastasia consults her liturgical calendar to find which foods are appropriate for the day. These regulations were laid down more than 500 years ago. Observing them precisely is the cornerstone of the old belief. By ritualizing the simplest of human acts, like cooking and eating, all of life is turned into a sacrament. Life on earth becomes a foretaste of heaven. These children are reaching back through time, touching the Christianity that was brought to ancient Rus some 1,000 years ago by the Greeks of Byzantium. In the 15th century, the Turks destroyed the Byzantine Empire. Muscovy elevated itself to a new status, Holy Russia, the last bastion of the one true church. The Prince of Moscow crowned himself Tsar, the Christian Caesar, appointed to prepare the world for Christ's second coming. The memory of Holy Russia, a land chosen and blessed by God, continues to guide the lives of the Rutovs in Canada. In 1653, Patriarch Nikon of Moscow announced a series of reforms designed to bring the Russian church more into line with European practice. Among other innovations, the Lord's Prayer was to be reworded and the spelling of the holy name of Jesus was to be changed. The sign of the cross, made in Russia with two fingers raised, was now to be made with three fingers. To the Russian people, changing the forms of faith was tantamount to changing the faith itself. Hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, who would come to be called old believers, refused to accept Nikon's reforms. Give us back our Christ, they cried. Imprisonment, torture and mass executions failed to quell their passionate resistance. The two-fingered sign of the cross became their gesture of defiance, a symbol of their faith in a faithless world. And so it remains today. The heretics cross themselves like this, with three fingers, like they're picking tobacco. But the Christians, old believers as they call us, we never change. We continue on and on in the old ways. We cross ourselves like this with two fingers. We Ukrainians do it this way, with three fingers. Three fingers is not a sign of the cross, it's nothing. What is that? We believe it symbolizes the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. Well, it's wrong. Every time you make the sign of the cross, you commit a sin. The more you pray, the more you sin. <laughs> this stubborn certainty drove the old believers into isolation, both geographical and spiritual. Entire villages fled deep into the forests, leaving behind more than just their material possessions. The Russian bishops supported the Patriarch, and only bishops can ordain priests. In time, the old believers lost their clergy, and with them, access to the sacraments. 
Salvation now was to be found not in any church nor in a czar, but rather in memory, in isolation, and in suffering. In the 18th century, Peter the Great decided to make Russia into a modern Western nation. As a gesture of contempt for the past, Peter forced Russian men to shave their beards and wear a modern face. But tradition taught that man was made in God's image. To shave was to desecrate that image. With European fashions came European vices. Smoking, gambling, drunkenness, venereal disease. For the old believers, Peter the Great was the Antichrist, the devil incarnate. All attempts to hold on to the past were ruthlessly crushed by Peter's new European trained army. The old believers retreated further and further, deep into Siberia and into the frontier regions of Poland and Turkey. Since then, they've been wandering in the wilderness, shut out from the Holy Garden in Russia's distant past. It's springtime in Alberta, the time of resurrection. Lent is almost at an end, that period of prayer and fasting that purifies Christians for Easter, the holiest of holy days in the Christian calendar. The old believers, young and old alike, have fasted and abstained from meat for 40 days. Now they're getting ready for the Easter feast. The house is clean to welcome the risen Christ, who will come to purify the world. Anastasia cleans the icons, the family's most precious possessions. The work requires extraordinary care because these sacred images are filled with God's spirit. Their final washing is in river water. Afterwards, the water is returned to its source, charged with the power of the icons. It's a time of death as well as life. The harsh rituals of slaughter recall Christ's blood poured out to save the world. Most of the old believers' dietary prohibitions follow the Old Testament, but the pig is considered a clean animal. Tradition says that when Christ was being crucified, mocking soldiers offered him pig's bile to quench his thirst. And so pork is proper food for Easter.
As Palm Sunday approaches, the children gather pussy willows in memory of Christ's entry into Jerusalem. The multitudes strewed palm leaves in his path and proclaimed him king. But he entered the city not to be crowned, but to be crucified. After a long dark winter, these first buds of spring are reminders of the resurrection and Christ's triumph over death. Just as these candles are being made to receive a flame, so humanity awaits the spark of new life. For Russian Christians, the Easter story reverberates with history. Over the centuries, Russia has lived and relived Christ's journey to the cross. From this experience of suffering, time and myth and history have fused into a passionate assertion. The ugliness and savagery of death is not the end. As Christ suffered and died and rose in glory from the dead, so the battered nation of Russia and all those who died in Christ will rise from the dead. In 1917, the latest philosophy from the West was brought into Russia, Marxism, with its promise of a material paradise on Earth. Vladimir Lenin and his band of disciples preached violently against religion, communism's greatest enemy. The battle was on again. Untold numbers of Christians were labeled insects and exterminated. A few thousand old believers managed to escape across Siberia into China. The Reds were victorious. They won over the whites. They beat them, they arrested them, they sent them off. Soon afterwards, our people began to be taken away. The communists called one of our elders to a meeting. The elder went through the village, saying his goodbyes, begging forgiveness and asking for a blessing, as is our Christian custom. When he came to where the Reds were, there was an old shack. And when he got there, they started stoning him. He fell down, he was groaning with pain. Then a red soldier came along, took a long bayonet and stabbed him and put him out of his misery. The communists killed other people. They started closing churches and burning icons and doing abominations. The Reds came to our house and saw our icons and holy books. They started laughing at my mother. Oh, you must be a holy woman. The Reds knew our people are forbidden to smoke, so they ripped pages out of our holy books and rolled cigarettes with them, just so they could defile them. They performed the same kinds of abominations with our icons. The churches were all closed, the crosses, the icons, everything was either smashed or taken away. They made a dance hall for young communists out of our church, a kind of youth club, removed everything and turned our church into a club.
Now, as then, Easter is an enduring promise that redeems terrible experience. Its meaning is contained in the egg, round like the world, and like the world, the womb of new life. Four letters are painted on each egg, standing for the traditional exchange Christos Voskres, Christ is risen. Voistene Voskres, truly, he is risen. The service, conducted without priests or sacraments, begins at midnight and lasts for eight full hours. The congregation stands throughout, participating in nothing less than the salvation of the entire world. Past, present and future. In him is the light, and the light is the light of the world. Today there's extra cause for celebration. Fedosia, one of the Rutov's daughters, has returned with her children and her French-Canadian husband, Ken, to share the Easter festival. By rights, they should not be sitting here at the table, but today some rules are bent a little. Fedosia became a heretic when she married an outsider. The Rutovs risk pollution, hoping that Ken will convert and that Fedosia will return to the fold of old belief. For Fedosia, it's a painful dilemma. I miss the family because they're not allowed to come see me here. I, I can go there, but sometimes I'm busy. Can't go, can't go, and like my brothers and sisters, they're not allowed to come stay with me. Or when I ask for help, they're always too busy to help me. So I kind of miss having the family around, but it will never be the same for me to go back there and be treated like one of them. I won't, I'll never be treated like that. <laughs> There's no middle ground here. You submit to the faith, or you're alone with your freedom. Old believer settlements are not religious communes, 
like those of the Hutterites, for example. The needs of the family take precedence over the needs of the community. Each household tries to be economically self-sufficient. This dried flax will be spun into thread and then woven into linen on a loom. But some things can't be grown. Barns and trucks and farm machinery mean cash, and that must be earned in the world, beyond the farm. In the summer, fathers and sons go out to the northern bush to plant trees under government contract. In the winter, they work as loggers. The work pays well. At 10 cents a seedling, an average worker can make over $200 a day. And the isolation suits the old believers. In the bush, far away from the contamination of modern life, they re-enter their distant past, working once more in a northern forest, awaiting God's final judgment. Tree planting and logging have been part of the old believers' economy only since they came to North America. But it continues a tradition established generations ago, when the men and boys went out for months at a time to hunt and fish. In the northern forests, the past, the present and the future easily merge together. The trappings of the world may change, but the world itself remains eternal. <laughs> and the reason why I like it in the wilderness is because it's peaceful, quiet, just the sound of the birds, the animals in the river, waves hitting the shore, and it's a nice sound. But the city, just sounds of the cars just zooming by at night. You never have a peaceful sleep at night. You know, cars zooming back and forth, planes taking off, drunk people going door to door, knocking, and not, it's not, the city is not as good as, as it is in the wilderness. While the men are away in the bush, the women run the farm and look after the children. The Rutovs coax a year's supply of food out of 30 acres, winter fodder for the livestock, vegetables, and wheat to make their bread. This peaceful scene in northern Alberta gives no hint of the journey that brought the old believers here. It has been a long march across the world, a flight from violence and hunger, with several stopping points along the way. In 1935, Japan invaded China. In 
the peace the old believers had found there was shattered. The Soviet Union joined the conflict, and in one of the battles, Baba's husband, Yevgeny, was captured and taken back to Russia. There, he disappeared into Stalin's gulag. Baba and her five small children faced starvation. It was this way. We lived terribly. All we had was the rugs on our back. We had nothing to eat. One day, my dear mother went into despair. She clutched the children to her and started crying. At one time, God blessed us with everything, but now he's letting us starve. We must have committed some terrible sin. Just then, as my mother was crying, a swarm of bees came by and landed on our fence. I took the old bucket and scooped up the bees and put them in a sack. I repaired an old beehive and put the swarm of bees inside. Within days, these bees produced five gallons of honey. I took the honey and went down to the Chinese settlement, where I traded it for 10 pounds of millet. Then I ran all the way home, seven kilometers. I was running and crying all the way, saying, Give glory to God, the Lord has saved us. I got home, cooked the millet, and fed the children. You see, God sent us those bees, which gave us the honey, for which we got millet. God saved us from starvation. The bees made more honey, and I gave some to the children in the cup. They were so happy. Honey, 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 was all they could say. That's how we lived. It was so hard. After the Second World War, Mao Zedong and the Communists took control of China and repeated Lenin's experiment in social engineering. The Chinese communists forced everybody to be the same. They didn't want foreigners. They wanted us to be like them. They wanted to put us in communes, just like in the Soviet Union. There was violence going on everywhere. The roads were covered with bodies. The communists killed all the people who were convicted of being against the regime. Well, our people got scared. They started inquiring. They found out that it was possible to go abroad. And then an organization got hold of things and helped us to leave. We left for Brazil. I gave birth to six children in Brazil. The land wasn't good. It was hot and dry. The animals would get sick, they'd get worms. Potatoes, greens, all vegetables had to be irrigated. The people who had stopped in America on their way to Brazil said it was good in America. So an advance group went there and then started calling their people, saying that it was really good. And so, one after another, many of us went to America. But when we got to America, the children had to go to American schools right away. They mixed with the other children. There was smoking, there was drugs. They got hold of filthy magazines. Even the children would say, we don't like it here, we should live on a farm. So we went and started looking for a place again. We came here. It's far from people, not crowded. Here we can grow crops. Here we can do something for the children. I 
I don't know what God has in store for us. We trust in God. What He will give us, so it shall be. We have been wandering and wandering. Since the end of the war, this is our sixth place. We traveled in China, we moved twice in Brazil, then to America, from America to Canada, and so we move on and on through the world. We have managed to catch our breath here in Canada. Be fruitful and multiply. The biblical instruction is followed faithfully here. Children are guarantees of the future, sharing the labor of both physical and spiritual survival. Each child is born into a world of cosmic struggle. Around these children, an invisible battle rages as Christ and Satan fight for their immortal souls. Old believers arm their children for this lifelong struggle with an embroidered blouse representing civilization, a cross to scare away the devil, and a belt that ties the human spirit to God. The greatest weapon is the Holy Word. They memorize the Bible in Old Slavonic, the language of the early Russian church. Pronounced correctly, the words are powerful antidotes to evil. These Russians have a proverb, opinion is the mother of all suffering. For them, Orthodox Christianity long ago solved all the problems of why and how humanity should live. Childhood doesn't last long here. Most girls get married in their teens and start their families at once. Maria is 17. She wears a crown in anticipation of her marriage when she'll become queen of her new household. Her friends are helping to prepare her trousseau. This period before the wedding is called the Devyeshnik. It's a time both of joy and sadness, of looking forward to the responsibilities of adult life and leaving behind forever the simpler days of childhood. <laughs> the future bride is toasted with raw eggs. They're believed to increase a woman's fertility and improve her singing voice at the same time. <laughs> Baba is weaving Maria's belt, a traditional part of the bride's trousseau. The belt will be tied around her waist, the center of all physical appetites. It's a sign that the spirit must restrain the body, or the ties to the old ways will be broken. The belt is a reminder that with God, all things are possible, but not all things are allowed. While their belts tie the old believers to their faith, 
forces from our society work to loosen these bonds. These kids in northern Alberta exist in two opposing worlds, trying on the uniforms and the values of both. Cars and leather jackets and the ribbons of the bridal wreath. It's the beginning of a rift between the generations, between those who are in fashion and those who are behind the times. One there. Anything else? Stand there on her head right now. Okay, no, it's your turn. with me. There's a bitter irony here. The old believers fought and died and traveled the world in search of independence and freedom. They arrived in North America to find those values turned against them. What will these youngsters choose? Freedom from the world or from their faith? There's an old Russian story about the devil who tried to turn people from God with wars and pestilence and famine. The people clung to their faith. So the devil came up with an even more diabolical plan. He said to his fellow demons, let's give them a really good harvest. Here in North America, for the first time in their history, the old believers are threatened not by persecution, but by bounty, democracy, and the belief in personal freedom. The children must go to school. The law insists on it. And there the cultures clash. The two worldviews have little common ground. In our society, education is seen as a basic right, the pathway to independent thought. For the old believers, it's a source of pollution. They keep their children's school years to the minimum yes. required by law. Okay, read. Okay, so all these words that are underlined have which two vowels? O U. With one foot in the world of their parents, the other in the world of their classmates, these children are inevitably left confused. Okay, the sound is like O. Well, our religion says they don't go to moon. They don't go to, you know, God won't let them pass, go up to the moon because, you know, well, there is no era there and our, them, we go there and they teach us that they're, you know, they go to the moon and shuttle blowing up and all that stuff, there's satellites and everything. Like right now, our religion says that, you know, there isn't anything up there, you know? Well doesn't say that there isn't anything up there, but they can't get up to the up to space, you know. Well, I don't even know if they do or not, but it states that nothing, nobody could go there, you know. But right now there's satellites there and them flying there and all that. Well, when I asked him, you know, in school I asked Mr. Amy and other teachers, I asked them, like, when, when the rocket gets out, uh, out of the Earth's atmosphere, you know, where there's no air. Once it hits the, where there's no air, you know, what do the engines push against, you know? So no, no, none of them answered that yet, but, so I don't even know what to follow. So I guess I'm still following our religion and will teach my sons and daughters the same thing. What I was born with, I'll end with it. The world of the old believers is under siege. This time, the battle involves us all. Curiosity and an occasional shopping trip bring the Rutovs to Edmonton to take a look at the West Edmonton Mall. These visitors from history remind us where we too have come from, make us question where we're going.
We live in a gigantic marketplace where everything is packaged for our consumption. Who can resist this glittering illusion with its promise of endless novelty and freedom, its assumption of absolute power? Most tyrannies of the past have ruled by inflicting pain, but our brave new world controls us by inflicting pleasure. There seems to be no stopping, no turning back. Who would want the hardships of our distant past? But what do we have instead? Lost in the rush of progress, we're turned into children again, without memory, without purpose, just dreams and desires for the future. Watching the fashion show, Anastasia remarked that when the end of the world comes, it will probably begin here, in the West Edmonton Mall. When we came here, there was hardly anybody. But now they are building all around us, and I don't know how it will be in the future. Is it going to continue like this? We don't want to see our children getting into trouble and challenging authority. We are prepared to move further and further into the forest, where we'll find more trees, as they say. <laughs> But where can they go? The forces that threaten their safety now threaten the entire planet. The spiritual contamination they fled for centuries now fills the air and water everywhere. The world is disappearing into the marketplace. The old believers have awaited the final judgment for many long years, living a life of rigid self-denial and discipline. The judgment may be ready now, but not because they failed in faithfulness. This is a world with no more hiding places. What remains is the enduring promise. I am with you always, even to the end of time. Behold, I make all things new. <laughs> 